Good afternoon. Instead of, instead of 60 slides in 13 minutes, I'm going to do no slides in 60 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the future. Is it going to be driverless cars or is it going to be driverless transit? Are we at the Rubicon? Are we at a position where it's going to go one way or the other? Where are we headed? So to think about this, I want to paint two different scenarios. And I'm deliberately making them more different than you might want to. But, but just for the sake of argument, let's consider two different scenarios. We have a scenario where driverless cars predominate as one scenario. So in this scenario, the infrastructure, the roads and the rail lines and all those kinds of things pretty much stay the same. What we do is we remove the drivers. So we don't have drivers in cars, we don't have drivers in trains or buses, but, but the cars still look pretty much the same. The trains are still big and heavy and so are the buses and so are the trucks. So it's all if you, if you were to take photographs, it would look pretty much the same, but we've removed the drivers, made it automated. The other scenario I want to paint on, on the other side is that we have different infrastructure. We have driverless transit that is more like the automated transit networks that we've been talking about here in the last day and a half. So. We have uh, lots of small guideways, mostly elevated, separated from the ground. We no longer have so much area devoted to transportation on the ground. Everything is also driverless, and uh, but we, we also change, for example, the size of vehicles. Instead of huge buses, we have small vehicles, many of them running mostly on elevated guideways. Instead of big trucks, we may still have a few of them, but much of the goods that, that's moved is disaggregated so that it can go more directly from the factory to the uh, purchaser without having to be warehoused in between, and so on. So these are two different scenarios. And I submit that in the future, we could move towards either one of them. So the question is, which one do we want to go towards? Where are we headed? And I've considered a number of different aspects, including safety, congestion, capacity, infrastructure, severance, energy use, cost, walkability and real estate. And I'm not going to bore you by going through all of those, but let's just look at the, the key ones, safety and congestion or capacity. So if we start with safety, it seems to me that driverless cars are going to result in more safety. They are likely to improve safety, even though there's a lot of counterintuitive things that are happening. As Alan mentioned, Safety went up, back up in, I think it was 2012. Uh, there was a recent report that lane keeping technology that helps you stay in your lane has made those cars that have it no safer than cars that don't have it. So some of these safety things may or may not happen, but overall I believe that driverless cars will be safer. There is evidence that driverless transit is much safer. Th there's uh, a couple of hundred million injury-free passenger miles to date on automated transit networks. No accidents, no injuries even. That is unmatched with driven systems. So we know that driverless transit is safer. So in the driverless transit scenario, we have, and I should have said this, we have a lot more people using transit. We go from five or ten percent in most cities to fifty or more percent. So if we have a lot more people using a system that's a lot safer, it's probably going to be a bit safer 
than the driverless car scenario. So both are, both are fairly safe, both are good. Now let's think about capacity and congestion. Well, in order to increase capacity, the first thing that people think of doing is reducing headway, which is the time or the distance between vehicles on the road or on the guideway. You can do this in two different ways. One of which is you can increase the, capacity, the ability of the second vehicle to stop if the vehicle in front of it stops suddenly. Now, when you start looking at how this happens, there are two laws that apply. One is Moore's law, which the computer people know about, and the other laws are Newton's laws. And I would submit that in this case, Newton's laws are much more important than Moore's law. That in fact, which, what hap matters is where the rubber meets the road. You can only brake so fast on a, a rubber vehicle on a roadway, especially when you have to consider patchy road conditions. So if the vehicle in front stops very fast, the vehicle in behind cannot guarantee that it can stop very fast. So what we're going to find, and I believe that the motor industry developing driverless cars is focused on safety first, so they're not going to try to reduce the headways. In fact, they may even slightly increase them. They can increase them too much, or the cars will become totally dysfunctional. But they, I don't believe that they're going to try to decrease them for a long, long time, if ever. So shorter headways on the road are just not going to happen in the reasonably foreseeable future. So then you have to think about vehicle miles traveled. You, you know, I, I don't think there's any doubt that, that people will share ownership of automobiles, but will that result in reduced vehicle miles traveled? Will it result in less trips? I think it may not. I think you may go to work and then send your car somewhere else to park. That's less expensive. That could increase vehicle miles traveled. What if you go to work and you send your car all the way home to park because that's free. And why wouldn't you do that during the rush hour? Why would you care if your car was on the road stuck in the rush hour traffic if you weren't in it? So this is maybe an extreme example, but it certainly could happen. That would increase vehicle miles traveled. If you could sleep or work in your vehicle, would you maybe live further away from work? That would increase vehicle miles traveled. So there are all these scenarios that could increase vehicle miles traveled. Even if you have shared vehicles, automated taxis, they're not going to be full all the time. Part of the time they're going to be driving around empty for the next fare, going to the next fare or whatever. That is going to increase vehicle miles traveled. So I would submit that we're looking at a scenario where we can't really get more cars on the road and there are going to be more cars on the road. And that's going to lead to increased congestion, not reduced congestion. Now, Alan had the key. The key is ride sharing. Now, back in 1983, I wrote a paper on ride sharing and thought, hey, it would be really easy to implement this wonderful idea of ride sharing. Well, that just hasn't come true. Years and years later, and I know because I've lived through every one of those long years, it hasn't got better. Ride sharing is not working. So why would you ride share in the future if you don't ride share now? Why would you share a taxi in the future that doesn't have a driver in it and so it costs less if you don't share taxis now that are more expensive? It doesn't seem like it'll work. I think ride sharing may be like the paperless office, which I'm still waiting to happen. So in my opinion, this future where we have to have different infrastructure that functions differently but more effectively is a more attractive future. It's one where we could have uh, new cities or new communities developed that are literally car-free. 
where the guideways are mostly elevated and where they serve literally every house. You could have clusters of, of six or eight homes around a small station. Um, and you could live in a park-like environment where walking and biking is just wonderful and easy to do and very safe. So the question becomes, which one do we really want? Which, which one do, will other people want? That's what I want, but does everybody want that? I don't know. I think we need a series of workshops around the country where we look at these different scenarios and we have people themselves decide which future they want. Then, if we discover which future they want, then we need to work to bring that future about. Then in another five years, we need to do it all over again and, and update it and keep iterating and keep improving until we get the future we want instead of waiting to let the future happen, which is what we're doing now. It's just going to happen to us. And by the way, the future that's going to happen easier is the driverless car future because that doesn't require public agencies to acquire systems and go through all these huge processes. It's up to the manufacturers to make the vehicles and sell them to the people, which they're very, very, very good at. If you look at all the commercials with cars driving out in the country, they're never stuck in traffic in the commercials. The other thing we can do is, is level the playing field. If, if the um, economy, if, if the business case, or, or not the business case, the the natural trend of things is going to lead to driverless cars rather than driverless transit, maybe we should remove some of the barriers for driverless transit. And this can be done very easily. And I have a few ideas. We can remove the biases from technology selection. For example, the rules and regulations are always framed around corridors. Well, transit networks operate in networks, so they're immediately at a disadvantage when you compare them to corridor systems. Yet, how many people really want to travel in a corridor to get to work or wherever? We can encourage the foreign technologies that are already in existence to come to the US. Right now, we don't encourage that. And if we had foreign PRT, ATN suppliers building their systems here in the US, then the systems would, would become established, and that would help the local suppliers and developers to establish business cases for their systems. Finally, we need to educate and encourage transit professionals so that they know what these systems are and they know how they work and they know what they cost and they know how to plan them. And then also we need to work towards demonstration projects. So in wrapping it up, we may not be at the Rubicon, but I think we owe it to our children to give them a better future. Thank you.